Now, if you've been an edge wood person, edgeite, I guess you would say, uh, for a long period of time, you would think to yourself, seven verses? Really, Roger? We've done way more, and we have. I feel like there's a lot of meat on those bones. We'll start chapter six, and then by God's grace, we'll c- continue and finish it the next time we're together. So, with that being said, Acts chapter 6, starting in verse 1. As you're turning there, recall, by way of review, the book of Acts is about the way that the apostles acted after the ascension of Jesus Christ. It's going to uncover the history as well as the theology of the early church. Very action-packed, a lot of movement, a lot of excitement going on. Remember we said the book of Acts covers 35 years of church history, 35 years. Uh, You'll see right on your handout, if you have it in front of you, on the screen, right, there we go. Acts chapter 1 to 2 is roughly 30 AD is what we believe. Acts chapter 5 now begins at 35 AD. So I just want to draw your attention as we get into chapter 6. It is believed five, a little over five years have now happened. So now we're about five and a half, six years into the history of the church. I just want to draw that to your attention. Remember we said last week, you've heard me say this a dozen times. um, If you were to pull out a sheet of paper and draw out the nation of Israel. It'll be the shape roughly of about a sweet potato. It's like the shape of a sweet potato. It's divided in the days of Jesus into three sections. The north is Galilee, the middle of Samaria, and the very bottom is Judea where Jerusalem is. So Jesus and the disciples are all from the north, the Galilee. 80% of Jesus' ministry takes place there. Of course, the middle is Samaria. If you're familiar with the Bible, that's where the Good Samaritan, the, you know, the, the conflict between the Jews and the Samaritans, that's that region. It is believed that they did not want to travel through to get to Judea through Samaria. They would sail around it because they don't even want to step foot in, in, in Samaria. And the very bottom is Judea. The disciples at this point are on the very bottom in the, the southern portion in Judea, but they're all from Galilee. We said last week, they come from affluent fish businesses. A lot of them had money. A lot of them had businesses. A lot of them had wealth. A lot of them had uh, futures that were secure and safe and cushy. And we said last week, in order for these disciples to follow Jesus, they left everything behind. You'll recall this. We also mentioned in Acts chapter 3, verse 1, no need to go there, but Acts chapter 3, verse 1, I'll read it to you. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. You recall, they're going to heal, a a gentleman's going to be healed that's begging for money in front of that temple. Uh, And because of this, now the officials go on top of uh, John and Peter. They throw him in prison. They are now rescued out of prison. Acts chapter 5, verse 12 is going to say, The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. And so what's, what's believed right here in Acts chapter 5, by the time we get to chapter 6, this early church no longer goes to the temple. It's no longer safe. So now they start to meet at homes. Now they start meeting in what we know as church services now. They meet at home. They're going to meet at various places. It says right there they met at at Solomon's Colonnade, which would have been a very well-known corner of the temple at that time. And so we don't know. Are they underground? Yes. Do they have home churches? Yes. Are they renting someplace? We don't know. But now officially the believers stop going to temple because now it's unsafe. Now they start meeting on their own. Acts chapter 5 verse 40. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. You remember last week we said that word flogged in the original language is flay. Flay. It means to peel the skin back. So we see the disciples and the, the, the apostles and all those followers of Jesus now are scarred for life. They're willing to now bear the physical scars. It has gone beyond name calling. Now they're no longer safe physically. And it's going to say, they, were, they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and then let them go, which we ended our time yesterday about civil disobedience is what we were talking about. So you want to write this down. This is going to be a pivotal turn in the church. Write this down. It's the first time believers are called disciples. Write that down. It's the first time believers are called disciples, okay? So this term for disciple, now they are becoming followers of Jesus Christ. As we said, it's no longer safe for them to go to the temple. Now they start meeting at home and they start meeting at other locations. We have different churches begin to to spread. What does persecution do? If there's any good that comes out of persecution, it causes God's people to leave the holy huddle. They're all together and now the gospel spreads. Now the church begins to spread out. So now they're no longer going to the temple. What it does, it reveals who's legitimate. It reveals who the real disciples are because now they're realizing following Jesus could come with a price. 
It could come losing your family. It could come you walking away from everything. We, I, I've, I've met believers. I've heard stories of believers from India who come to Jesus, come to faith. And uh, the, some certain young man, he was about 19, 20 years old, comes to faith in Christ. His family is so outraged and insulted by it, they chain him in front of a tree. They nearly beat him to death and abandon him because he came to know Jesus. Uh, those in the Arab world coming to know Jesus and losing their family, their family telling them, you're no longer our child, you're no longer a son or daughter, you're dead to us. Losing their inheritance, losing their family. So what they're seeing, following Jesus could be very, very costly. So what it does, it reveals who's the real disciple. It reveals who's legitimate. I've heard this story years ago through the, the Fox's Book of Martyrs. Um, I don't quite know how true this is, but I heard this story for years growing up, and it's a story of a church, and this is like pre, a little bit during the USSR period in Russia, and they had tremendous persecution from the government. The church, the believers are underground. Uh, one gentleman comes in with a ski mask and a, uh, a shotgun and, and tells everyone to get out, renounce Christ and run out. And so the story goes that many people ran out, others stayed, and then that individual took off their ski mask. It ended up being one, one of the elders, one of the leaders of the church and said, okay, pastor, now we can start. We have the true disciples in the building. And so it's, it's a way to kind of show, listen, following Jesus could be very costly. Following Jesus could lead to persecution, if not even death. Recall, out of the 12 disciples, 11 out of 12 end up losing their lives for Jesus. So this is not, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Right now they're being incarcerated and they're being flogged. They're going to see the heat begin to become intensified. So chapter 6, verse 1, if you're there this morning, say word. word. All right, let's jump in with both feet. In those days, by the way, those are the days we're talking about. They're no longer going to the temple now. It's no longer safe. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, your attention please, in spite of persecution, people are coming to know Christ by the thousands. And this is just a really neat thing. There's no advantage to becoming a Christian. There's no political advantage. There's no business advantage. advantage there's no financial advantage. There conversions, conversions are genuine. They're true followers of Jesus. It's going to say this, the Hellenistic Jews, you want to underline that, we'll get there in a second, among them complained against the Hebraic Jews, you want to underline that as well, we'll get to that in a second, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So with your pen, pencil, lipstick, mascara in handy, write down on your handout, with growth, came new challenges. Write that down. With growth came new challenges. The church is growing. And what's happened, they're starting to see people come to faith who are not only coming from a Jewish background, they're also coming from a Gentile background. And it's people who are outside of Israel. And so they're going to have two opposing worldviews, two opposing camps now battle once, uh, against one another. So let's define Hebrew believers and Hellenist believers. On your handout, Hebrew believers were from the Jewish culture, Hellenist believers were from the Greek culture. So one is going to want to preserve the Jewish roots. They're Hebrew. They're born in Israel. They're Hebrew by nationality. They're Hebrew by birth. Uh, they are Hebrew in their culture. They're Hebrew, Hebrew in their customs. And what began to happen, now that they're not meeting in the temple and now they're at the home churches, what do you begin, what do you think starts to creep into the gospel? A lot of their Hebrew beliefs and faith. And so that's going to be some of the corrections that Paul has later. Say, whoa, whoa, whoa. We're Jesus before we are Jewish and anything else. And so he's going to correct them later on in his books, Paul will. And so the Hellenist believers were from a Greek culture. A lot of those Hellenist believers were born outside of Jerusalem. They're outside of Israel. They're not Israeli by birth. And so you have two opposing worldviews. You have two opposing beliefs and two opposing customs. It doesn't take long to compare different cultures. Every culture has different values. Every culture has different customs. Um, even the way that we celebrate things, the way that you celebrate Christmas would be different. I remember growing up, we had Noche Buena. We would celebrate on 24th in the evening. Some celebrate 25th in the morning. Some just kind of sleep in because they celebrate it the night before. Or some wake up early and celebrate Christmas. Regardless, we would celebrate things differently. There's different opposing cultures and different opposing worldviews. I've had a very unique thing that the Lord has kind of brought me through like a buffet of church background experience. And so I'm so grateful for that. I, I became a believer at an evangelical free church. I found myself interning at a PCA Presbyterian church. I was hired by an Assemblies of God church to be a youth pastor. I then went on to a Calvary chapel. Uh, I then went 
uh, into the, and more into the Baptist, and that's kind of, I haven't really left that circle. I went more into the SBC. And so I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful the Lord has had me experience different things, experience different traditions, experience different vantage points. If you know this, if you've experienced church from a different context, you know how that's like. You know how it's different. Maybe you grew up in a different culture than where you are now. Maybe it's totally different. Uh, for instance, have you ever been a part, anybody ever grow up in a throne church? You ever heard of that, a throne church? Nobody? Okay, so a throne church is where the pastor's preaching. They would have what would look like thrones. There's seats on the platform, and the pastor is the assistant pastor, and some of the elders sit on the platform. Anybody ever experience a church? Okay, yeah. So you've seen this. You've seen this happen. Okay, so we know that as a throne church. And so I, the church I grew up in, I never saw that. I, I, was, I was brand new to that. I remember years ago, I was invited to speak at a youth event, and uh, they had me also speak the following Sunday there. So I, I, just, I was there for the weekend. And spoke to the students, spoke Sunday. And listen, I, I spoke at a graduation in 2023, uh, a high school graduation. You sit on the platform, but the whole faculty's with you. If you're in education, you're sitting on the platform, it's graduation. It's not uncommon. When you're the only one sitting on the platform, it's awkward. It's uncomfortable. So I, I go and I'm there for the announcements. The guy said, oh, hey, pastor, you're going to go sit up there on the platform. I'm like, you're on the platform? Yeah, just go in and sit there. And I remember my response to him was like, what do I do there? Like, what do I do? I just sit there? Yeah, I just sit there. Do I take notes? Yeah, I just sit there. What? And so it's awkward. You're the only one there. You're sitting down. Everyone's looking at you. Everyone's observing you. I make it look like, you know, I'm taking notes, right? I'm thinking, get a gallon of milk after church, right? So I'm just, I'm taking notes. Everyone's looking at you. Like, what do I do? I was totally, totally unfamiliar with that culture. I remember a good friend of mine saying this. He was invited to a church. We no longer use this word very often, but they had a benediction after service. Okay, a benediction is a closing prayer. And so if you're not used to that background, if you're, if you're maybe uh, some Baptist, many Baptists don't even know what that is. And so I, I recall my friend being at this church, he preaches, he's leaving, the, the pastor now crosses him and says, hey, I'm gonna call you back up for the benediction. And he's like, what's a benediction? And the pastor's like, it's a closing prayer. Oh, okay, I could do that. Why are you using this fancy terminology? So oftentimes in our church cultures, we'll experience something different. It's no different in the first century, especially the church only being about five years old. That still becomes to come in. Why? The enemy's crafty. The preferences start to come in. Your background comes in. Your culture begins to come in. And now we see some clashing. Something to understand, something to comprehend. It's talking about taking care of the widows. This is going to be a major issue at this time. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 16, Paul will address this later on. If any woman who is a believer has dependent widows, she must assist them and the church must not be burdened so that it may assist those who are widows indeed. So in other words, Paul is saying, hey, if there's any family member of that widow, um, they are to take care of them, right? We don't want to burden the ministry. We, want to, we don't want to burden the movement of what's happening. The family is responsible to look after that individual, right? B depending on the case. You're talking first century Middle East. Women, unfortunately, at this, this time period, were considered like property. So if her husband dies, it's not like she can go out and get a job. She's destitute. They, a lot of them lose their resources. A lot of them lose ways that they can produce income. Remember, in the Middle East and Saudi Arabia, just a handful of years ago, women were allowed to drive. So you see in the Middle East, this is not new, even current day. What Jesus did, he was countercultural. He elevated women. He had women followers. He had women disciples. He had women authority. And so Jesus does this, and he empowered women in his day, which was very countercultural. Here's what we know according to history. There was roughly... Three to 400 widows in this time period. So that's, that's a lot of people. We're not talking to two or three, three to 400. This is such a need in their ministry. What we know later on in the book of Acts, they hired seven full-time people just to oversee that ministry alone. So we can see that that was a big issue there at that time. Write this down. What's the result? Growing frustration from church members. Write that down. Growing frustration from church members. And by the way, when they address this, when Dr. Luke addresses this in Acts chapter one or Acts chapter six, it's not preference. It's not going to be like we're going to look at the preference of worship, the preference of culture, the preference of what we want to do, and the color of the carpet and the style of worship, the the Bible translation. Here's the issue: our widows are eating, or, or our widows are not eating, and there's ours. 
That they were going hungry. They were starving. They were in need of their necessities. And so that's the issue being addressed there. Acts chapter 6, verse 2. Acts chapter 6, verse 2. So the 12, so the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Your attention, please. Interesting phraseology, because you can almost read it and look at that. Huh, who's the author of this? Dr. Luke, not wanting to wait on tables. What on earth is he talking about? We'll write this down. We'll put some context to it. The apostles were saying, the apostles are saying they're above it. It should say they are not above it. I'm so sorry. That's a typo. Can you put that slide up, Miss Nora? The apostles are saying they're not above it. So that should, there should be a, a not after the there. If, if that makes sense, say yes. So the apostles are saying they are not above it, that they are not above it. They're willing to serve. They're willing to roll up their sleeves. They're willing to get dirty, if you will. They're willing to serve and do these things. What's happened is that it's become so time-consuming for, the, for these apostles, these early guys. And so rather than teaching, they began to do it. And for many of them, that hospitality, that serving gift, that wasn't theirs. We don't look at a situation and say, oh, sorry, pastor, I can't pray for you. Not my gift. That should never be our heart. But what's happened is, is that the need was so great for those widows, the 300 to 400 widows, uh, that now the apostles had to go for outside help where the seven full-time people would come and oversee that. So it's not a very good use of their time at that time. Write this down in your handout. It was time to cut what was good to do what was best. It was time to cut what was good to do what was best. So that was their takeaway. That was their conclusion. Hey, well, the church is growing by the thousands. We need more leadership. We need to appoint more leadership. And so the apostles are saying, let's not get, get too busy with this ministry. Let's hand it off and empower people so that we can go ahead and lead and plan other things. Does that make sense? And so that's really the heartbeat behind that. Write that down. In this case, doing what was good was wrong. Okay, in this case, doing what was good was wrong. That's a heartbeat of the Lord. It's a heartbeat for the ministry. Uh, for them in the first century to employ full-time seven individuals to oversee this ministry, it shows a heartbeat. It shows something that's important to them. This is not a way for the disciples to say, you know what? That's beneath me. I'm not going to set up a chair. You know what? That's, that's beneath me. I'm not going to pick up a broom. That's not their heart at all. Their heart is saying, hey, with this demand and the growth of the church, we need to now spread ourselves out, right? So don't, let's not get that twisted. I know a lot of, a lot of uh, opponents of the Bible will use that verse and say, look, that's what happens with church leadership. And they're saying, we just want to be mindful and strategic about it. If that makes sense, say yes. Okay? Verse 3. So I'll give you some of that cultural background. Verse 3. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. So you want to circle, highlight, underline, full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them. Again, these are that full-time, seven, seven full-time people that they are now appointing for ministry. Verse 4, and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. So again, that's the disciple saying, we're going to take our hands off here. We're going to empower some folks to go to this ministry so that way we can keep teaching and keep planting and keep raising up leaders for the church that's growing by the thousandfold. Okay? So you want to write this down in your handout. They realize it was time to empower the right people for ministry. They realize it was time to empower the right people, emphasis on right people, for ministry. And that's the vision here at Edgewood. Uh, it's very simple. We want to equip the saints. We want to come into the church service. We realize we're set up by rows, and we want to get in God's Word. We go through books of the Bible chapter by chapter, verse by verse. When I have individuals tell me, I've been to church my entire life, and I've never heard that, it makes my heart smile. That's what we do. We want to disciple. We want to make the disciple. We want to equip the disciples, which is what we're doing. We also want to be attractional so people can come in and also receive Christ as Savior. We also want to build community. That's why we have community groups here at Edgewood. We have one that also exists off campus. Many of them take place on Sunday morning. We want you to go from rows now to circles. In a row, it's hard to facilitate conversation. You're right now, this is a monologue. You're here under a message, under a message, under God's word, right? You're not here to really to have that conversation in rows. That's why we want you in, in a community group. We want you to get to know folks, get to learn their names, get to know their stories, get into the word together, hold each other accountable. Lastly, we want to empower people for ministry. We don't just want to puff our head up with pride. We want to send out and empower. Do you realize over the last few years, um, hard to believe, January will be the beginning for me of year seven here at Edgewood. Yeah, year seven, yeah. Wait, no. 
Uh, no, this will be going into year eight. This would be the beginning of year eight at Edgewood. And, and, uh, unbelievable. By the way, the national average for a pastor is three to five years. You're way above the national average. So praise God. That's, that's, real, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. So um, in the years that we've been here, we've had, of course, the COVID. The pandemic came, and that was kind of, we never saw that coming. By God's grace, we were able to make it through. And um, we, we, God has provided for us. We have seen, we had an internship prior to that. You will recall, we've had interns come through our ministry. We've had interns that have come through our ministry, and now they're serving full-time somewhere. You did that. You gave many of those kids, and I hate to say kids, they were college kids when they were here. They're no longer M. Two of them are already married. Um, they're already off into their ministry. They have all gone to do full-time ministry. One is in Africa right now, if you, if you don't know. Emma Eirich is serving full-time in a ministry uh, ed in education in Africa. She, she was here as an intern. Uh, many of you recall Zach. Zach was here in her, with her student ministry, and so now he's also full-time with CBM. Uh, children's Bible Ministry in Tennessee, doing camp ministry. So we have seen through the years, um, you recall our former worship leader, if you were not here, Joseph. Joseph McGuffey, who come, he came here and he was in full-time ministry. He came in and he was in a season of life of, of transition. The Lord calls him back into full-time ministry. You not only launched people, you also were able to provide a safe place for people to get healed and then be sent out. Pastor Bob, Bob Gardner, who was a former worship guy as well. Same, same situation. He's now serving full-time in Ohio. And that makes my heart smile. We're ascending church. We're not here to hoard people. We're not here to like hoard resources. We're not here to hold everything and say they belong to us. People don't belong to us. They belong to Jesus. And so we've been able to send people out. So we want to empower the right people. Acts chapter 6, verse 3. It's going to say this. Acts 6, 3. Therefore, brethren, select among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, who we may put in charge of this task. So right in front of you, qualifications to oversee ministry. Qualifications to oversee ministry. Number one, among you. So he's going to say, select from among you seven men, right? So it's going to be people that are well known. So they're going to be people that we know. It's always, it's always dangerous when churches lay hands on people too quickly. Um, it, I was... Uh, I was ordained uh, a few years ago. I believe back in 2016 is when I was officially ordained. I was in ministry years before I was ever ordained. You don't need ordination to serve Jesus. That's what I think. Uh, but when I was ordained years ago, I was part of my ordination council. I, like a fool, um, I had to get my own ordination council. I had two theology buffs, good buddies of mine that were theology buffs. So the idea is that your ordination council, they make you write like a dissertation. They interview behind, you, behind closed doors. They're asking you questions about your theology, what you believe, how you solve this, how you solve that, how's your family life, how's your marriage, uh, finances, are you in debt? And so they begin to grill you. And I had those two theologian friends who made, I mean, they hammered me. I remember leaving that room and, and just sweating profusely. They let me have it. If you ask me, in the Southern Baptist circles, we're a little too loose to ordain sometimes. They'll say, do you go to church? Do you tithe? You own a Bible? Great, let's lay hands. And I feel like sometimes you don't want to be too quick to lay hands on people. And so that's what he's saying. They're going to be among us. But number two, write this down, good reputation. They should also have a good reputation. They should be a people of good reputation, as Luke says in Acts chapter 6. They're dealing with money. They're dealing with people. Can we trust them behind closed doors? Who they are behind closed doors, are they the same in person in public? Is it the same person? Is there integrity in their life? Is there integrity in their habits? Can we trust them? Number three, spiritual and practical. Write that down. Spiritual and practical. And I love that phrase, spiritual and practical. Why? Because it's a balance. We want to make sure they're full of the Spirit, but we've got to make sure they're gifted in what they do. Right? Spiritual and practical. They need to be spiritual. They need to be full of the Spirit. They need to have a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. They also need to be good at what they do. Right? Oftentimes, uh, the church kind of does things, can do things. The church culture can be like, ah, oh, that's enough. That's enough. If we are doing things for the Lord, it should always be done with excellence. If you are someone who's a follower of Jesus Christ, you go to work tomorrow until they send you home for that hurricane. You go to work tomorrow and you are a follower of Jesus Christ. You being a Christian is a stamp of quality on your life. Your boss should look at you and say, man, there's something different about those Christians. I should hire Christians more often. They never call out sick. They're never late. They never come up with excuses. They're the first to grab the broom. They're the first to ask, how can I help? They're the first to squash drama or gossip. They're the first to do this. You being a Christian is stamp of quality. And that's the heartbeat behind that. We want to make sure it gets done well, full of spirit and also practical as well in the ministry. So far, so good? All right, verse 5. 
This proposal pleased the whole group. In other words, they're all in accord. Here are the seven guys. Here's where they're going to name them. The, they chose the first one. What's that name? Stephen. Some say Stephen. Some say Stephen. Either way, next to Stephen, write crown. Stephen means crown. Like a king's crown. Stephen means crown. I don't want to spoil the movie for you. Spoiler alert. He will be the first martyr. Up until this point, people have been incarcerated. Up until this point, people have been flogged. Up until this point, people have had to run and, and hide for safety. But nobody's lost their life yet. Stephen will be the very first one to lose his life for the cause of Christ. He'll be the first martyr. So they chose Stephen. That's that guy. We'll learn more about him in the upcoming weeks. A man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmi Parmenius, and Nicholas from Antioch, and you'll notice, comma, a convert to Judaism. That's Luke's way of saying that this guy, Nicholas, the last guy, he's not a Jew. He's, he's saying basically he's coming from a non-Jewish background. And so now we're starting to see those Gentiles now come to faith. Now, uh, you'll notice this in 6.8. Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. So this guy is not only called by God, he's anointed. They're starting to see people, uh, they're starting to see uh, Stephen be used mightily for the Lord. Acts 8.5, just to go a little bit ahead, that second guy, Philip. We'll see Philip later on in our study. But Acts chapter 8 says this. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. So you want to tuck that away about Philip. We'll see that's another guy that's mentioned. Acts 21 verse 8. It's going to say this about Philip. Acts 21 verse 8. We stayed at the house of Philip, the evangelist, one of the seven. And by the way, that, that conclusion will be 54 AD. So we see Philip be a guy who's been faithful. He's remained steadfast. He served the Lord. And God's used him mightily through the years for the next couple of decades. So they selected the seven. Verse 6. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So we notice that order. They first prayed and then empowered. They prayed and empowered. It's always, you always want to be careful not to lay hands on somebody too quickly. And so they prayed first and then they were empowered. You recall Daniel. Daniel, when he receives the second half of Daniel, the very first half was all about Daniel's life. The second half had to do with the prophecies of the future. You Wednesday night folks know exactly what I'm talking about. Daniel's first inclination was to face the window, heading, facing his nation. He falls down to his knees. He begins to pray to the Lord. What he's seeing of the future is disturbing him. What he's seeing of the future is filling his heart with anguish because he realizes whatever my nation, Israel, is going through now, this ain't nothing yet. Israel hasn't seen it yet. So he begins to pray. But what we see his order, he stops, he prays, he gets in the word, and he fasts. And that should be the order, the plan of the, of the disciple. We're going to pray. We're going to get in the word. We're going to fast. And so we see uh, Daniel begin to do that. And we begin to see the same thing here in the early church. So write this down. Their ministry was in their local church. Write that down. Their ministry was in their local church. It was them serving one another. It was the body now being parts of the body. So you know, if you've ever jammed a finger, you ever jammed a toe, your foot is useless. You ever jammed your thumb, your hand is completely useless. There isn't a part of your body that's insignificant, even that pesky little pinky toe. Once a part of the body doesn't want to participate, it hurts the rest of the body. So we see the body of Christ, the bride, now begin to serve one another. Galatians 5.13, through love, serve one another. So write this down in your handout as well. Their ministry was unique to their church's situation. Write that down. Their ministry was unique to their church's situation. So that church in the first century, uh, uh, pro roughly around the 30s and 40s AD, is different from 2023. Uh, our, our locations are different. Our time period is different. But their ministry was very, very specific to what it is that they were going through. So how did they feed the widows? We don't know. Where did they meet? We really don't know. How did they fund it? We don't know. Do they rent a space? Do they go in a home? Do they just go underground? We don't know any of these details. We just know that they were serving. We know that they were serving the body. They were serving the Lord, and they were faithful in doing so. So here's my question for you. Have you found your place of ministry? What has God called you to do? What has God called you to do? What is the calling God has placed on your life? What is God stirring in you? I'll, I'll, I'll answer it this way. You ever come to church, and I'm sure you're going to say never, right? You'll never do this. You, have you ever come to church and look at a situation and say, that could be done better? Nobody, right? 
Here's the question, or here's, here's a statement. We should always have a critical eye. We should never have a critical heart. We should never have a critical heart, but we should always have a critical eye. I submit to you this. Once you see something and said, man, that could be done differently, if you begin to unravel that, that could be where God is calling you, giving you the shoulder tap to plug in. That could be. That could be really the beginning, the, the beginning point, your entry point into ministry. What has God called you to? What is it that you're passionate about? Because if you're alive, you're breathing, and you receive Jesus as Savior, you're called to ministry. Who's called to ministry? Pastor Roger? Who's called to ministry? All of us. All of us. If you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, we're called to ministry. So let's do this. I'm going to do some shameless plugs. Is that okay? I mean, what are you going to say, right? No, pastor, no. So write this down in your handout. Invite someone to sit next to you. Invite someone to sit next to you. Hey, listen, you know what attracts people to church? It's not the worship. It's not the pastor. It's not the building. It's not even the seating or the chairs. You know what invites? You know, you know what it does? People inviting others to church. Am I accepted? Do people know me? Do they notice when I'm gone? Those are the questions people ask. So, are we the type of church that says, you know, in our church, nobody sits by themselves? Are we the type of church that says nobody sits by themselves? You have to ask that question. Are we that church? Listen, if the Lord were to bring you 150 people next time we're together, are we ready? If God brought the harvest and we had 150 new faces that walked in this door, are we ready? Because if we're not faithful now, when the 150 comes in, as the kids say, we're cooked. Are we the church that invites people? Are we the church that's going to reach across the aisle and say, good morning, glad you're here. Welcome to church. Are we the type of church that's going to say, where have you been or how have you been? So we don't want to get on the where have you been. We want to get on the how have you been, right? And so are we that type of church to say that? Reach out and say, hi, my name is so-and-so. Come sit with me. You're brand new? Come sit with me. You have no one to sit with? Come sit with me. Listen, it's going to require the church to get a little uncomfortable, but it's okay. Our skin's not getting flayed. We're not running undercover. We're not meeting underground, and the government's not after us. Our discomfort is, who's going to sit by me for the next 30 minutes, Right? Invite somebody to sit by you. Invite someone to sit by you. Can I tell you, I'm a product of that. I'm a product of that. I came to really know Jesus as Savior my sophomore year of high school. I came to this youth group. Um, I, was, I was a sophomore. I skipped every single week. Didn't go. Mama didn't know. Mama found out the day that I got into a car accident because I got in a car with a friend. He ran a red light. We got into a car accident. I don't know how. The car, I closed my eyes. We ended up on the side of the road. There's smoke coming out of the engine. That scared the dickens out of me, if I could use that phrase. It brought me right back to church. And I realized to myself as a young kid, listen, maybe Maybe skipping church is not a good idea. So now I'm like, oh, I'll go to this church. I'll go to this church. In this youth group, while I was there as a sophomore, there was a student by the name of Bill, Bill Mitchell. And he's a fellow sophomore. He's the same grade as I was in high school. He was tall. He was lanky. And I don't mean to be disparaging. I don't mean to be disrespectful. He's a homeschooler. And so I had my preconceived notions of what a homeschooler was and how I could treat it and whatever the case may be. So Bill comes to me and he says, listen, we have this event coming to our church. We have this event. You should go to this event. And I said, there's no way. I'm here on Sunday. That's enough. I'm not coming for a weekend. You must be outside of your mind. He comes at me every single week, every single week. He saw me. He loved me. Hey, Roger, come sit by me. Hey, Roger, come join us. Hey, Roger, Let's include you a part of this. And he comes after me week after week after week. And I say, no, let me tell you, I try to think of every single thing for him to leave me alone. I try to make him as uncomfortable as possible for him not to invite me, but Bill didn't give up. Finally, it's, this is almost beyond harassment. And I finally relent and I say, Bill, I'll go to your event. Please don't ask me again. I go to this event. He even says, hey, I'll pay your way. He paid my way. I'll go to this event, sophomore year of high school, January. My life is radically changed. I received Christ as Savior legitimately at that time. And it came through an invite. I don't care what the pastor said. I, don't, I wasn't paying attention. I wasn't there half the time. <laughs> you know, the worship's going on. I'm in the bathroom. I'm not in there. I'm, I'm, I'm out in the halls. I'm socializing. What brought me to the Lord? An invite. An invite. And it takes the individual to say, hey, come join us. Come join us. Come sit with me. Come join us. Are we the church that does that? Write this down as well. Their ministry wasn't glamorous, 
but indispensable. It wasn't glamorous, but it was indispensable. So write that down. Write that down. It wasn't glamorous. They're doing ministry. They're being obedient. They're full of the Holy Spirit. They're being faithful with where they are. Listen, we're not called to be Billy Graham. We're not called to be that rock star Christian. We're called to be faithful and to be ourselves and to use what we bring to the table. We're we're called to be faithful where we are. Write this down. Their ministry was the beginning of a greater ministry. Their ministry was the beginning of a greater ministry. You'll see this. You'll see this. Acts chapter 6 verse 8, which we've read. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. It's never about the vessel. It's always about the Lord, right? So Stephen's being used by God. We saw again with Philip. Uh, Philip went down to the the city of Samaria, began proclaiming Christ to them. So we saw them begin to become empowered. It goes from I go to church to I go to my church. That's the difference. I go to church to I go to my church. I go to my church. Write this down. Notice their ministry— began not by saying, I'm not called to this, but how can I help? It started by not saying, I'm not called to this. We don't say, well, I'm not called to that. I'm not going to do that. But it starts with saying, how can I help? Now, remember how I told you we're beginning year eight in January? Unbelievable. Listen, can I tell you this and still be on speaking terms? Um, Where are you serving? If you consider this to be your home church, where are you serving? If you consider this to be your home church, are you tithing? If you consider this to be a home church, is there sweat equity? Is there sweat equity? Because here what we see in this early church, only about five years old, six years old, they're rolling up their sleeves and they're participating. A church is never about a pastor. Pastors are like football coaches. They come and go. It's about the church. It's about the people. Does the church want to grow? Does the church want to thrive? Because a lot of churches, unfortunately, they don't want to grow. They want to be comfortable right where they are. Church at Edgewood, do you want to grow? If the Lord brought us 150 people, if the Lord brought us 20 people, if the Lord brought us 10 people, 10 families, are we ready? That's what I'm saying to you. If the Lord brings a harvest, is our heart ready? Is, is our, are our hands involved in the ministry? Is our heart invested in the ministry? How are we serving? If the Lord brings a harvest, I want to make sure that we're ready. Amen? So let's get ready. Let's get ready. Now, As we're landing the plane, chapter 6, verse 7, last verse as the worship team comes up. Verse 7. So the word of God, what did it do? It spread. The word is spreading. The word's getting out. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Don't miss that last detail. How great is that? A large number of those priests in the temple are now coming to faith to know the Lord. You imagine you're in a Bible study, you're in your community group, and a former priest comes in. That's super cool. You, be, you now begin to see it's more than just these fishermen. Now it's spreading. This church is now booming. It's on fire. It's growing, and it's vibrant. Three results that happen as a result. Three results on your handout. Three results. The first one, God's word spreads. God's word spreads. Remember with that persecution, you can't look at that persecution and say, me oh me, my oh my, has God left us? No, God has empowered them and now the church spreads out. It goes from like a little holy huddle in Jerusalem and now it begins to scatter. Now they're seeing thousands of people come to know the Lord. His word is gonna spread. Write this down, the disciples increase. The disciples increase. We now have legitimate, real followers of Jesus Christ. This is not we're we're a fan of Jesus. This is not we like Jesus. This is now Jesus becoming Lord and Savior of my life. It's different. Now they're true disciples of Jesus. The last one, write this down. What we saw there, a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Write this down. Key influencers are converted. Key influencers are converted. And that's really exciting because now they're starting to see movers and shakers and influencers in their culture now come to faith. Again, it goes beyond a handful of fishermen. You're going to have Simon the Zealot, who is really an anarchist. You're going to have Matthew the tax collector. You're going to have this ragamuffin, rough group of men now being miraculously used by the power of God. And as it does, the disciples uh, are, are, are... tripled, quadrupled, and key people are now beginning to get converted. The church is literally on fire. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16. The whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building of itself and love. You know, it hurts me and pains me to say this. I realize the older I get, you know, 
my metabolism slows down. Have you noticed that? I don't like it. I don't like it. I used to have, drink a milkshake, go run out to football practice and nothing. Now it's like I have to run four miles to like run a milkshake off, right? You be, your body begins to store this excess fat and it's just so hard to get rid of sometimes. Like, how do I get rid of this? What does fat do? It slows the body down. What does fat do? It harms the body. In the same way, the body of Christ, that excess, the, the excess, the, the group that is not serving, it weighs the body down. Because when the body doesn't get involved, it hurts the body as a whole. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we do thank you for this morning. We thank you for those that are watching online. And Lord, I do pray, would you help us, Father? Maybe if there's an area that maybe you are calling us to. We haven't stepped out yet. We haven't vocalized, but you've put something on our heart. Father, I pray that we would be obedient to step out and maybe begin the questions or begin the conversation of serving in that area of ministry. Father, I do pray, pray for those that are serving faithfully. I know that that call is on everybody. There are many in this room that are involved in, in some form of ministry, and I just thank you for them. Father, this is not about one person. This is not a one-man show. It's an army of people collectively that want to honor and serve you uh, that make this even possible in the first place. So I thank you for their faithfulness. I pray that you would bless them. Be with us now as we leave. Keep us safe with the storm to come. Uh, if you're here under the sound of my voice and, and you haven't prayed to receive Christ as Savior, you are interested in becoming a disciple of His. You're not, you don't want to become a fan of Jesus. You want to be a follower of Jesus. You want to give your life. You want to give your heart to, to the Lord. If you're watching online, listen, you're here by divine appointment. Regardless of how you found us, if somebody invited you or you just happened to stumble across uh, this, this channel or, or this message right now, the Lord, the God of the universe is pursuing you today. And if you want to open up your heart, open up your life to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, I encourage you and invite you to pray this right now in your head and in your heart. Say, Father, forgive me of my sin. I know that I'm a sinner. Right now, King Jesus, step out of heaven and come into my heart. Come into my life to be my God, my Savior, and my friend. I commit to follow you, Lord Jesus, the rest of my life. I follow you as your disciple. I give you everything. It's yours. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that for the very first time, if you are watching online, please email us, church, um, churchoffice at caelakeland.com. We'll love to be in touch with you. If you prayed that here for the very first time, I cannot assume in just a couple of seconds, I'm going to close in prayer and I'll be by the double doors. I'd love to meet with you, congratulate you and also put a Bible in your hand, amen. So please stand up as we worship together and as we close our service.